committee will be in order. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Mr. Chairman, President Trump's tweet drew tens of thousands of Americans to Washington to form the angry crowd that would be transformed on January the 6th into a violent mob. Dr. Donnell Harvin, who was the Chief of Homeland Security and Intelligence for D.C., told the committee how his team saw Trump's December 19th tweet unite violent groups across the spectrum on the far right. We, we, we got derogatory information from OSINT suggesting that uh, some very, very violent individuals uh, were organizing uh, to come to D.C. And not only were they um, organizing to come to D.C., but they were uh, these groups, uh, these non-aligned uh, groups were aligning. Um, and so the, the, the red, all the red flags went up at that point. You know, when you have our militia, um, uh, you know, collaborating with white supremacy groups, collaborating with um, uh, conspiracy theory groups online, all toward the common goal, you start seeing uh, what we call in, in you know, terrorism a blended ideology, and that's a very, very bad sign. Then w when they were clearly across, not just across one platform, but across multiple platforms with these groups coordinating, not just like chatting, hey, how's it going, you know, <laughs> what's the weather like where you're at, but like, what are you bringing, what are you wearing, uh, you know, where, where, where do we meet up? Uh, do you have plans for the Capitol? That's operational, that's like pre-operational intelligence, right? Um, and that, that is something that's clearly alarming. The Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers are two key groups that responded immediately to President Trump's call. The Proud Boys are a far-right street-fighting group that glorifies violence and white supremacy. The Oath Keepers are extremists who promote a wide range of conspiracy theories and sought to act as a private paramilitary force for Donald Trump. The Department of Justice has charged leaders of both groups with seditious conspiracy to overthrow the government of the United States on January the 6th. Trump's December 19th tweet motivated these two extremist groups, which have historically not worked together to coordinate their activities. December 19th at 10.22 a.m., just hours after President Trump's tweet, Kelly Meggs, the head of the Florida Oath Keepers, declared an alliance among the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, and the Florida Three Percenters, another militia group. He wrote, we have decided to work together and shut this shit down. Phone records obtained by the Select Committee show that later that afternoon, Mr. Meggs called Proud Boys leader Enrique Terrio, and they spoke for several minutes. The very next day, the Proud Boys got to work. The Proud Boys launched an encrypted chat called the Ministry of Self-Defense. The committee obtained hundreds of these messages, which show strategic and tactical planning about January the 6th, including maps of Washington, D.C. that pinpoint the location of police. In the weeks leading up to the attack, leaders in both the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers worked with Trump allies. One such ally was Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, Trump's former national security advisor and one of the participants in the unhinged meeting at the White House on December 18th. He also had connections to the Oath Keepers. This photo from December 12th shows Flynn and Patrick Byrne, another Trump ally who was present at that December 18th meeting, guarded by indicted Oath Keeper Roberto Minuta. Another view of the scene shows Oath Keepers leader Stuart Rhodes in the picture as well. Another central figure with ties to this network of extremist groups was Roger Stone, a political consultant and longtime confidant of President Trump. He pardoned both Flynn and Stone in the weeks between the election on November 3rd and January 6th. In the same time frame, Stone communicated with both the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers regularly. The committee obtained encrypted content from a group, from a group chat called Friends of Stone, FOS, which included Stone, Rhodes, Tario, and Ali Alexander. The chat focused on various pro-Trump events in November and December of 2020, as well as January 6th. As you can see here, Stuart Rhodes himself urged the Friends of Stone to have people go to their state capitals if they cannot make it to Washington for the first Million MAGA March 
on November 14th. These friends of Roger Stone had a significant presence at multiple pro-Trump events after the election, including in Washington on December the 12th. On that day, Stuart Rhodes called for Donald Trump to invoke martial law, promising bloodshed if he did not. He needs to know from you that you are with him, that he does not do it now. While he is commander in chief, we're going to have to do it ourselves later in a much more desperate, much more bloody war. Let's get it on now while he is still the commander in chief. Hooah! That night, the Proud Boys engaged in violence on the streets of Washington and hurled aggressive insults at the police. You oath breakers! Do your fucking job! Give us one hour! One hour! Just the previous night, the co-host of InfoWars issued an ominous warning at a rally alongside Roger Stone and Proud Boys leader Enrique Tarrio. Encrypted chats obtained by the select committee show that Kelly Meggs, the indicted leader of the Florida Oath Keepers, spoke directly with Roger Stone about security on January 5th and 6th. In fact, on January 6th, Stone was guarded by two Oath Keepers who have since been criminally indicted for seditious conspiracy. One of them later pleaded guilty and according to the Department of Justice, admitted that the Oath Keepers were ready to use, quote, lethal force if necessary against anyone who tried to remove President Trump from the White House, including the National Guard. As we've seen, the Proud Boys were also part of the Friends of Stone network. Stone's ties to the Proud Boys go back many years. He's even taken their so-called fraternity creed required for the first level of initiation to the group. Stone, a Western chauvinist, I refuse to apologize for the creative modern world. Thank you, Rob. Kelly Sorrell, a lawyer who assists the Oath Keepers and a volunteer lawyer for the Trump campaign, explained to the committee how Roger Stone and other figures brought extremists of different stripes and views together. You mentioned that Mr. Stone wanted to start the Stop the Steal series of rallies. Who did you consider the leader of these rallies? It sounds like, from what you just said, it was Mr. Stone, Mr. Jones, and Mr. Ali Alexander. Is that correct? Those are the ones that became like the, the center point for everything. We'll learn more from Ms. Murphy about these individuals and their involvement in the days leading up to the violent attack on January 6th. We'll also hear how they were allowed to speak at a rally for President Trump the night before January 6th, even though organizers had expressed serious concerns about their violent and extremist rhetoric directly to Mark Meadows. And you'll hear testimony from White House aides who were with the president as he watched the crowd from the Oval Office and will testify about how excited he was for the following day. Let me note now that our investigation continues on these critical issues. We have only shown a small fraction of what we have found. I look forward to the public release of more of our findings later, Mr. Chairman, and I now yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Murphy. During our most recent hearing, the committee showed some evidence of what President Trump, Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, and other White House officials knew about the potential for violence on January 6th. And despite this information, they made no effort to cancel the rally, halt the march to the Capitol, or even to lower the temperature among President Trump's supporters. Katrina Pearson, one of the organizers of January 6th rally and a former campaign spokeswoman for President Trump, grew increasingly apprehensive after learning that multiple activists had been proposed as speakers for the January 6th rally. These included some of the people we discussed earlier in this hearing. Roger Stone, 
a longtime outside advisor to President Trump. Alex Jones, the founder of the conspiracy theory website InfoWars. And Ali Alexander, an activist known for his violent political rhetoric. On December 30th, Ms. Pearson exchanged text messages with another key rally organizer about why people like Mr. Alexander and Mr. Jones were being suggested as speakers at the president's rally on January 6th. Ms. Pearson's explanation was POTUS, and she remarked that the president likes the crazies. The committee asked Ms. Pearson about these messages, and this is what she said. So when you said that he likes the crazies, were you talking about President Trump? Yes, I was talking about President Trump. He loved people who viciously defended him in public. But consistent in terms of the support for these people, at least with what the president likes from what you could tell. Yes, the, the people that would be very, very vicious in publicly defending him. On January 2nd, Ms. Pearson's concerns about the potential rally speakers had grown serious enough that she reached out to Mr. Meadows directly. She wrote, Good afternoon. Would you mind giving me a call regarding this January 6th event? Things have gotten crazy and I desperately need some direction, please. According to phone records obtained by the committee, Ms. Pearson received a phone call from Mr. Meadows eight minutes later. Here's what Ms. Pearson said about that conversation. So what specifically did you tell him though about other, other events? Just that there were a bunch of entities coming in. Um, some were very suspect, but they're gonna be on other, on other stages, um, some on other days. A very, very brief overview um, of what was actually happening um, and why I raised the red flags. And when you told him that people were very suspect, what, what did, did you tell him what you meant by that? Or what did you convey to him about what you were, um, the problems with these folks? I think I even texted him some of my concerns, um, but I did briefly go over some of the concerns that I had raised to everybody with Alex Jones or Ali Alexander and some of the rhetoric that they were doing. I probably mentioned to him um, that they had already caused trouble at other capitals or, or at the previous event, the previous march that they did for protesting, um, and I just had a concern about it. Ms. Pearson was especially concerned about Ali Alexander and Alex Jones because in November 2020, both men and some of their supporters had entered the Georgia State Capitol to protest the results of the 2020 election. Ms. Pearson believed that she mentioned this to Mark Meadows on this January 2nd call. Notably, January 2nd is the same day on which, according to Cassidy Hutchinson, Ms. Meadows, Mr. Meadows warned her of things, that things might get real, real bad on January 6th. After her January 2nd call with Mr. Meadows, Katrina Pearson sent an email to fellow rally organizers. She wrote, POTUS expectations are to have something intimate at the ellipse and call on everyone to march to the Capitol. President's own documents suggest that the president had decided to call on his supporters to go to the Capitol on January 6th, but that he chose not to widely announce it until his speech on the ellipse that morning. The committee has obtained this draft, updated, uh, uh, undated tweet from the National Archives. It includes a stamp stating, President has seen. The draft tweet reads, I will be making a big speech at 10 a.m. on January 6th at the Ellipse, south of the White House. Please arrive early, massive crowds expected. March to the Capitol after, stop the steal. Although this tweet was never sent, Rally organizers were discussing and preparing for the march to the Capitol in the days leading up to January 6. This is a January 4th text message from a rally organizer to Mike Lindell, the MyPillow CEO. The organizer says, you know, this stays between us. We're having a second stage at the Supreme Court again after the ellipse. POTUS is going to have us march there slash the Capitol. It cannot get out about the second stage because people will try and set up another and sabotage it. It can also not get out about the march because I will be in trouble with the National Park Service and all the agencies. But POTUS is going to just call for it, quote, unexpectedly. The end of the message indicates that the president's plan to have his followers march to the Capitol was not being broadly discussed. And then on the morning of January 5th, 
Ali Alexander, whose firebrand style concerned Katrina Pearson, sent a similar text to a conservative journalist. Mr. Alexander said, tomorrow, ellipse, then US Capitol. Trump is supposed to order us to the Capitol at the end of his speech, but we will see. President Trump did follow through on his plan, using his January 6th speech to tell his supporters to march to the Capitol on January 6th. The evidence confirms that this was not a spontaneous call to action, but rather was a deliberate strategy decided upon in advance by the president. Another part of the president's strategy involves certain members of Congress who amplified his unsupported assertions that the election had been stolen. In the weeks after the election, the White House coordinated closely with President Trump's allies in Congress to disseminate his false claims and to encourage members of the public to fight the outcome on January 6. We know that the president met with various members to discuss January 6 well before the joint session. The president's private schedule for De December 21st, 2020 shows a private meeting with Republican members of Congress. We know that Vice President Pence, Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, and Rudy Giuliani also attended that meeting. We obtained an email that was sent from Congressman Mo Brooks of Alabama to Mark Meadows setting up that meeting. The subject line is, White House meeting December 21st regarding January 6th. In his email, Congressman Brooks explained that he had not asked anyone to join him in the, quote, January 6th effort. Because in his view, quote, only citizens can exert the necessary influence on senators and congressmen to join this fight against massive voter fraud and election theft. At this point, you may also recall testimony given in our earlier hearing by Acting Attorney General Richard Donahue, who said that the president asked the Department of Justice to, quote, just say that the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. According to White House visitor logs obtained by the committee, members of Congress present at the White House on December 21st included Congressman Brian Babin, Andy Biggs, Matt Gates, Louis Gohmert, Paul Gosar, Andy Harris, Jody Heiss, Jim Jordan, and Scott Perry. Then Congresswoman-elect Marjorie Taylor Greene was also there. We heard testimony in an early hearing that a pardon was ultimately requested by Congressman Mo Brooks and other members of Congress who attended this meeting. We've asked witnesses what happened during the December 21st meeting. And we've learned that part of the discussion centered on the role of the vice president during the counting of the electoral votes. These members of Congress were discussing what would later be known as the Eastman theory, which was being pushed by attorney John Eastman. In one of our earlier hearings, you heard in great detail that President Trump was trying to convince Vice President Pence to do something illegal. His White House counsel confirmed all of that in testimony last week. Your view, Mr. Cipollone, upon that, those discussions with Mr. Philbin, with Greg Jacob, what, what was your assessment as to what the Vice President could or could not do at the joint session? What was my assessment about what he could or couldn't do? Yes, your view of the issue. My view was that the vice president had, didn't have a legal authority to do anything except what he did. They've both told us, Mr. Feldman and Mr. Jacob, that they looked very closely at the Eastman memos, the Eastman theory, and, and thought that it had no basis, that it was not a strategy that the, the president should pursue. It sounds like that's consistent with your impression as well. My impression would have been informed certainly by them. Campaign senior advisor Jason Miller told us that Mr. Cipollini thought John Eastman's theories were nutty, something Mr. Cipollini wouldn't refute. We received testimony from various people about this. About one was Jason Miller, who was a, a campaign, um, said that, that what was communicated to me was that Pat Cipollini thought the idea was nutty and at one point confronted Eastman basically with the same sentiment. That I don't have any reason to contradict what he said. On January 4th, John Eastman went to the White House to meet with the president and vice president. Mr. Cipollini tried to participate in this meeting, but he was apparently turned away. You didn't go to the meeting in the Oval Office where Eastman met with the president and with the vice president. Do you, know, do you remember why you didn't personally attend? 
I did walk to that meeting, and I did go into the Oval Office with the idea of attending that meeting, and then I ultimately did not attend that meeting. Why not? The reasons for that are privilege. Okay. Were you asked to not attend the meeting, or did you make a personal decision not to attend the meeting? Again, without getting into privilege. Recall that Greg Jacob, the vice president's counsel, stated that Mr. Eastman acknowledged he would lose nine to zero if his legal theory were challenged in the Supreme Court. Mr. Cipollini had reviewed Mr. Eastman's legal theory and expressed his view repeatedly that the vice president was right. He even offered to take the blame for the vice president's position. I thought that the vice president did not have the authority to do what was being suggested under a proper reading of the law. I conveyed that, okay? I think I actually told somebody that, you know, in the vice president's, just blame me. This, you know, this is, I'm not a politician, you know? I don't, and, but, you know, I just said, I'm a lawyer. This is my legal opinion. I, but let me tell you this. Can I say a word about the vice president? Please. I think the vice president did the right thing I think he did the courageous thing. I have a great deal of respect for Vice President Pence. I work with him very closely. I think he understood my opinion. I think he understood my opinion afterwards as well. I think he did a great service to this country. And I think I, I suggested to somebody that he should be given the presidential medal of freedom for, for his actions. Earlier this year, a federal district, district court judge concluded that President Trump and Mr. Eastman, relying on Mr. Eastman's theory, more likely than not violated multiple federal criminal laws in their pressure campaign against the vice president. Also recall earlier in this hearing, we saw that Rudy Giuliani's team did not have actual evidence of fraud sufficient to change the result of the election. That's important because as January 6th approached, the Republican members of the House and Senate were looking for reason to object to the electors, and no real evidence was ever given to them. And we know that Republican members of the House received a memorandum from the chairwoman of the House Republican Caucus in the days before January 6, explaining in detail the many constitutional and legal problems with objections and describing the principal judicial rulings dismissing the claims of widespread fraud. But their plan to object to the certification of the election on January 6 went forward anyway. The next day, on January 5th, the day before the attack on the Capitol, tens of thousands of people converged on Washington. While certain close associates of President Trump privately expressed concerns about what would occur on January 6, other members of the president's inner circle spoke with great anticipation about the events to come. The committee has learned from the White House phone logs that the president spoke to Steve Bannon, his close advisor, at least twice on January 5th. The first conversation they had lasted for 11 minutes. Listen to what Mr. Bannon said that day after the first call he had with the president. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. It's all converging and now we're on, as they say, the point of attack, right? The point of attack tomorrow. I'll tell you this, it's not gonna happen like you think it's gonna happen. Okay, it's going to be quite extraordinarily different. And all I can say is strap in. From those same phone logs, we know that the president and Mr. Bannon spoke again on the phone that evening, this time for six minutes. That same day, on the eve of January 6, supporters of President Trump gathered in Washington, D.C. at another rally. This rally was held at Freedom Plaza, which is located near the White House, and featured some of the speakers who Katrina Pearson and others deemed too extreme to share the stage with the president the next morning. And as this rally was underway, the president asked members of his staff to come to the Oval Office. Let's hear from the White House aides who were in the Oval Office that night. I was in the office, in the Oval Office, and he had asked me to open the door so that he could hear um, I guess there was a concert or a rap or something going on. Did he say anything other than just open the door? He, he made a comment. I don't remember specifically what he said, but there's a lot of energy. When we walked in, uh, the staff was um, kind of standing up and assembled along the wall. 
and the president was at the desk uh, and Dan Scavino was on the couch and the president was um, dictating a tweet that he wanted um, Scavino to send out. Then the president started talking about the rally the next day. Um, he had the door of um, the Oval open to the Rose Garden because you could hear um, the crowd already assembled outside on the ellipse and they were um, playing music and um, it was so loud that you could feel it shaking in the Oval. He was in um, a very good mood and I say that because he had not been in a good mood for weeks leading up to that and then it seemed like he was in a fantastic mood um, that evening. He asked if, if members of Congress would be with him tomorrow. And what did you understand by meaning voting in his favor as opposed to physically with him or anything like that? Yeah, and I took that to mean not voting to certify the election. Then he did look to the staff and ask for um, ideas of how, if I recall, he said um, that we could make the rhinos do the right thing is the way he phrased it. And um, n no one spoke up initially because I think everyone was trying to process what that he meant by that. The president was making notes then, talking then about we should go up to the Capitol. What's the best route to go to the Capitol? I said <laughs> he should focus on policy accomplishments. I, I didn't mention it. What was his response? He acknowledged that and, and said we've had a lot, something along those lines. And but then he fairly quickly moved to how fired up the crowd is, was going to be. And what did he say about it? Um, just that they were they were fired up, they were angry, they feel like the election's been stolen, that the election was rigged. Did he give any indication of how he knew that the crowd was fired up or angry? He continued to reference being able to hear them outside. Through the open door of the Oval Office, the president could hear the sound of the crowd and the music at the rally at the Freedom Plaza. And these are some of the things that they were saying there at the plaza, just blocks from where the president sat that evening, excited for the next day. This is nothing less than an epic struggle for the future of this country between dark and light, between the godly and the godless, between good and evil. And we will win this fight or America would step off into a thousand years of darkness. Tomorrow, tomorrow, trust me, the American people that are standing on the soil that we are standing on tonight, and they're gonna be standing on this soil tomorrow, this is soil that we have fought over, fought for, and we will fight for in the future. The members, the members of Congress, the members of the House of Representatives, the members of the, of the United States Senate, those of, the, those of you who are feeling weak tonight, those of you that don't have the moral fiber in your body, get some tonight because tomorrow we the people are going to be here and we want you to know that we will not stand for a lie. We will not stand for a lie. I want them to know that 1776 is always an option. give us what we want or we are going to shut this country down. It's 1776. 1776. 1776. 1776. At 5.05 p.m. as the Freedom Plaza rally was underway just blocks away, President Trump tweeted, Washington is being inundated with people who don't want to see an election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats. Our country has had enough. They won't take it anymore. 
To the crowds gathering in DC, he added, we hear you and love you from the Oval Office. The committee has learned that on January 5th, there were serious concerns at Twitter about the anticipated violence the next day. Listen to what the Twitter witness told us about their desperate efforts to get Twitter to do something. What was your, your gut feeling on the night of January 5th? I believe I sent a Slack message to someone that said something along the lines of, when people are shooting each other tomorrow, I will try and rest in the knowledge that we tried. Um, and so I went to, I don't know that I slept that night, to be honest with you. Um, I, I was on pins and needles um, because again, for, for months I had been begging and anticipating and attempting to raise the reality that if nothing, if we made no intervention into what I saw occurring, people were going to die. Um, and on January 5th, I realized no intervention was coming. Uh, no, there, and even as, as hard as I had tried to create one uh, or implement one, there was nothing and we were, we were at the whims um, and the mercy of a violent crowd that was yeah. locked and loaded. And just for the record, this was content that was echoing statements by the former president, but also Proud Boys um, and other um, known violent extremist groups? Yeah. There were also concerns among members of Congress. We have a recently released recording of a conversation that took place among Republican members in the U.S. Capitol on the eve of January 6. This is Republican Congresswoman Debbie Lesko from Arizona, who led some of the unfounded objections to the election results. I also asked leadership to come up with a safety plan for members. I'm actually very concerned about this because we have, who knows how many hundreds of thousands of people coming here. We have Antifa. Uh, we also have, quite honestly, Trump supporters who actually believe that we are going to overturn the election. And when that doesn't happen, most likely will not happen, they are going to go nuts. That same evening, as President Trump listened to the rally from the Oval Office, he was also working on his speech to be delivered the next day. And based on documents we've received from the National Archives, including multiple drafts of the President's speech, as well as from witness testimony, we understand how that speech devolved into a call to action and a call to fight. One of the first edits President Trump made to his speech was to incorporate his 5.05 p.m. tweet, revising his speech to say, all of us are here today, do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats. Our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore. He also added, together, we will stop the steal. President Trump's edits continued into the morning of January 6. And as you can see from the president's daily diary here, the president spoke to his chief speechwriter, Stephen Miller, for over 25 minutes that morning. Following his call with Mr. Miller, President Trump inserted for the first time a line in his speech that said, quote, and we will see whether Mike Pence enters history as a truly great and courageous leader. All he has to do is refer the illegally submitted electoral votes back to the states that were given false and fraudulent information where they want to recertify. No prior version of this speech had referenced Vice President Pence or his role during the joint session on January 6th. These last minute edits by President Trump to his speech were part of the president's pressure campaign against his own vice president. But not everyone wanted these lines regarding the vice president included in the president's speech, including White House lawyer Eric Hirschman. Did you ever speak to anybody in the White House at the time about this disagreement um, between the president and the vice president other than the president based on the objection from your counsel? Um, maybe had a brief conversation about it with uh, Eric Hirschman. Tell me about that. What do you remember him saying to you about this disagreement? Um, I just remember him um, saying that um, 
that he had a um, I don't want to get this wrong. Oh, sort of some of the effect of um, thinking that it would be counterproductive. I think he thought to um, uh, to discuss the matter publicly. So it came up in the context of editing the president's speech on January the sixth. I just came up with the conversation where Eric knew it was in the speech, and so he had a, a sidebar with me about it. And so the speechwriters took that advice and removed the lines about Vice President Pence. And later that morning at 11.20 a.m., President Trump had a phone call with the vice president. And as the committee detailed in an earlier hearing, that phone call was, by all accounts, tense and heated. During this call, the vice president told pre the president that he would not attempt to change the outcome of the election. In response, the president called the vice president of the United States a wimp and other derogatory words. As you can see in this email, after Vice President Pence told President Trump that he would not unilaterally deliver him a second term in office, the speechwriters were directed to reinsert the Mike Pence lines. Here is how one of the speechwriters described President Trump's last minute change to the speech. And as I recall, there was a very tough, um, a tough sentence about the vice president that was that was was added. President Trump wanted to use his speech to attack Vice President Pence in front of a crowd of thousands of angry supporters who had been led to believe the election was stolen. When President Trump arrived at the Ellipse to deliver his speech, he was still worked up from his call with Vice President Pence. And although Ivanka Trump would not say so, her chief of staff gave the committee some insight into the president's frustration. It's been reported that you ultimately decided to attend the rally because you hoped that you would calm the president and keep the event on an even keel. Is that accurate? No, I, I don't know who said that or where that came from. What did she share with you about why it was concerning that her father was upset or agitated after that call with Vice President Pence in relation to the Ellipse rally? Why did that matter? Why did he have to be calmed down, I should say? Well, she shared that he had called the vice president a not an expletive word. I think that bothered her. And I think she could tell based on the conversations and what was going on in the office that he was angry and upset and people were providing misinformation and she felt like she might be able to help calm the situation down, um, at least before he went on to stage. The president did go on stage, and then he gave the speech that he wanted to give. It included the formal changes he had requested the night before and in that morning, but also many important last minute ad lib changes. A single scripted reference in the speech to Mike Pence became eight. A single scripted reference to rally goers marching to the Capitol became four, with President Trump ad-libbing that he would be joining the protesters at the Capitol. Added throughout his speech were references to fighting and the need for people to have courage and to be strong. The word peacefully was in the staff written script and used only once. Here are some of these ad-lib changes that the president made to his speech. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. So I hope Mike has the courage to do what he has to do. And I hope he doesn't listen to the rhinos and the stupid people that he's listening to. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. But we're going to try and give our Republicans the weak ones, because the strong ones don't need any of our help. We're tr going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. So let's walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. White House counsel Pat Cipollone and his deputy did not attend the speech, and they were concerned that the statements in the speech about the election were false. In fact, 
The message that President Trump delivered that day was built on a foundation of lies. He lied to his supporters that the election was stolen. He stoked their anger. He called for them to fight for him. He directed them to the US Capitol. He told them he would join them. And his supporters believed him, and many headed towards the Capitol. As a result, people died. People were injured. Many of his supporters' lives will never be the same. President Trump's former campaign manager, Brad Parscale, recognized the impact of the speech immediately. And this is what he said on January 6th in excerpts from text messages to Katrina Pearson. Mr. Parscale said, quote, this is about Trump pushing for uncertainty in our country, a sitting president asking for civil war. And then when he said, this week I feel guilty for helping him win, Katrina Pearson responded, you did what you felt right at the time and therefore it was right. Mr. Parscale added, yeah, but a woman is dead. And yeah, if I was Trump and I knew my rhetoric killed someone. When Ms. Pearson replied, it wasn't the rhetoric. Mr. Pascal said, Katrina, yes it was.